Good morning. Welcome back. Welcome to the, na <clears throat> the Namaste experience. You know, we use those words a lot and, and we may even wonder sometimes, well, what does that mean exactly? The Namaste experience. Most of us know that the word Namaste refers to a willingness to perceive and to see and to know, we'll say the beloved in everyone that we meet. The beloved within me honors and blesses the beloved within you, the Christ within you, the light, whatever word we want to use. In fact, the deeper into that experience we go, the less meaning the words have, the less needed the words are. Words become what they are, symbols of symbols, twice removed from the truth. But the feeling, the energy, the light that begins to shine just overwhelms them all. That's the namaste experience. We leave behind all the symbols and we rest in God. That's the lesson from A Course in Miracles today. I rest in God. We just rest in the knowledge that one is one. Instead of the ego's illusion that one is two. <laughs> or one is two trillion or whatever it may be. Just resting in the knowledge and the experience that one is one. That's all we need. So, speaking of A Course in Miracles, here at, at Namaste Village, I think everything that we do is deeply influenced by the teachings of A Course in Miracles, because it is my spiritual foundation, and I know the spiritual foundation of many people here. But at the same time, we we don't, we lean into it, but we don't say that that is the, the spiritual foundation of the community. The spiritual foundation of the community is only love, which is the only lesson in the Course in Miracles. Just love no matter what, that's it. You, you do that, you've got the whole thing. Close the book. <laughs> I was told that um, Judy Scutch, who, who many of you know is, is the, the original publisher of, of the course. I was talking to her daughter the other day and, uh, and she said, my, my mom used to, like she would put the course on the floor and then she would stand on it. And people were shocked. Well, how can you stand on this sacred, this sacred piece of wisdom? Oops, sorry. And the whole point was put nothing on that pedestal, including this amazing book inspired, I truly believe, by the consciousness of the Christ or of the one. The extension of the love and the loveliness of God. Because as soon as we put a person or a book or a teaching or anything up on a pedestal, we create distance. We distance ourselves from it. And the whole point is to not do that. The whole point is to let that distance collapse until we know I am one. I am one with all there is, all there ever could be. So once again, here at Namaste Village, we'd certainly lean into that but not in a way that puts it up as an idol. And there are people here who are much more attracted to other forms of spiritual paths, and that's beautiful, perfect. That's what we honor here. We are what would I like to call an interspiritual contemplative community. But to have a foundation that no matter what it is that we're focused on, that foundation is always love. God is love, therefore so am I. However, I do want to talk about the Course a little bit today. Great. And the reason is because I've been reading um, an amazing book. It's called Journey Without Distance. Oh, yeah. How many of you have read that? Okay. Whoa. If you haven't read it, you got to read it. I mean, I knew quite a bit already about the story behind how A Course in Miracles was, was transcribed came about. I, I knew a good amount, but I, I didn't know the details like I know now. That book goes through every detail from, from the time 
Helen Shuckman was a little girl raised with no spiritual background at all, but she had a, a nanny who was very Catholic who would bring her to the Catholic Church, but Helen had to wait outside because she was told she wasn't Catholic, and while the nanny went inside for Mass, but Helen would just look through the cracks of that door and see this wonderful whole world that she didn't even know existed. And then there were there were other times where she 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 wanted to to know if she should follow this voice that she was hearing and feeling inside of her that was guiding her, and 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 she closed her eyes and said, "If I open my eyes and I see a shooting star, that will be the the that will be the sign that I'm to continue." She opened her eyes and there were like hundreds of shooting stars in that very second, and yet she still doubted. She, she never really came to a place of really fully believing. She would, when people would ask her why she didn't do the course, she would say, because I don't believe it, but I know it's true. Oh, oh my God. That's Helen, you know, and yet that's probably the reason why she was chosen because she wasn't a pious nun living in a convent or a monk in a monastery. She was this kind of crotchety old professor who, uh, didn't believe the whole time that she was doing it yeah. and and yet it took hold of her and they they stayed with it for so many years of course bill playing a huge huge role and then ultimately ken and judy and you know these these four primary people and this is what this book is about that the story of how all of this came about and i'll just say even though this is not definitely happening that there's a very strong chance that I'm going to be part of, of making a, a movie about the, the story of, of how the course came about. Because next year is the 50th anniversary of when A Course in Miracles was first printed. So we're talking about doing some really exciting things through the Foundation for Inner Peace. Anyway, so the reason I'm bringing this up is that in reading this book, it's, it has inspired me even much deeper than I was already inspired. And trust me, I was already pretty inspired. <laughs> but even more so that this is a divinely inspired teaching. And, and I know that there are a lot of people who say, well, the words are this and the, you know, the masculine pronouns are that. And, you know, and, and that's all fine because even the, the Course says that this is not the only way. It says this is a way. It is a very direct path, but there are other paths that may resonate with you deeper. Beautiful. But this, just reading the story, and I promise you, if you were to explore it further, you'd probably be as dedicated as I am, because there's no way any of this could have happened in any ordinary way. And there's no way any other voice could have ever, uh, could have ever brought through this wisdom except for the voice of Christ. Christ not necessarily being Jesus. I mean, we could do a whole probably five sessions on that. The Christ which is you, the Christ which is everything. Once again, the single extension of the love and the loveliness of God that somehow goes through a prism and then spreads out in as many colors, but still one extension of light, of love. And so this morning, I, I didn't really know what I was going to share, but I was reading, um, often I just open up A Course in Miracles, usually to the text, and I'll just read a paragraph. And so I want to begin by, by sharing what I read, and, and then, I'm, then I'll share a parable that came instantaneously as soon as I read it. Those who remember always that they know nothing and who have become willing to learn everything will learn it. What a powerful statement. Once again, those who remember always that they know nothing and who have become willing to learn everything will learn it. But Whenever they trust themselves, trust in their own knowing what they think they know, they will not learn because they're already filled. They, they already think they know. So you can't learn if you think you already know. 
They have destroyed their motivation for learning by thinking they already know. Think not you understand anything until you pass the test of perfect peace. This is key. Let me read it again. Think not that you understand anything until you pass the test of perfect peace. Peace without an opposite. What St. Paul called the peace that surpasses understanding. For peace and understanding go together. You can't understand, in other words, you can't truly comprehend until you are in that place of perfect peace. For peace and understanding go together and can never be found alone. Each brings the other with it. For it is the love of God that they be not separate. It is the love of God that they be not separate. Interesting that it says the love of God rather than the will of God, isn't it? It is the love of God that wills that peace and understanding come together in your mind. They, they are cause and effect, each to the other. So where one is absent, the other cannot be. If peace is absent, inner true inner perfect peace, peace without an opposite, understanding cannot be. That's what this is saying. Now, we can fight it. We can resist it. We can say, yeah, but. Once again, I have come to a place, and I invite you to this, but you don't have to. It's up to you. I have come to a place where I fully trust that. I fully trust that voice. Because it, for, for me to say, yeah, but it is an authority problem. Because that means that, oh, well, I know better. So I, I'm going to assert what I think I know. But what does this say at the very beginning? Those who remember always that they know nothing, but have become willing to learn everything, they will learn it. So the only proper response is surrender. The only proper response is to trust. So as I was thinking about this just this morning, the way I imagined it and the image that came into my mind is a, a fishbowl about that big, that has a fish in it, one fish. And in this fish bowl, there are fake rocks and fake plants. And this fish bowl rests at the bottom of the ocean. So the water that's in the fish bowl is the same water that's in the whole ocean. But this fish that's in the bowl decides that it's that the whole world is the inside of this bowl and that all the things that it sees and believes that it knows, the fake rocks, the fake plants, whatever else is in there, it believes it knows and will not leave the fishbowl. So this was the image that came to me immediately when I was reading. I was just asking, you know, help me to understand how I cannot know when it sure seems like I do. It sure seems like there's some things that I do know so help me understand this, and this is what came. There was once a large fishbowl that sat at the bottom of the ocean filled with fishbowl decorations and a single fish that never left the bowl. It looked around at the decorations that filled the fishbowl and thought that she knew a great deal. I know that this is a rock, she said, and I know that this plastic plant is real. One day, a fish from the outside swam up to the bowl and said, nothing you believe to be real inside the bowl is truly real, but you don't realize, you won't realize that until you swim out and join me and all the other fish that are swimming here in this huge ocean. The fish in the bowl was taken aback by the outsider's words. What nonsense, she exclaimed. Why would I leave the safety and comfort of my home? Everything I need is right here. Of course, the fish has forgotten that the water inside the bowl is the same as the water outside the bowl. And there's no lid. It's not like there's anything keeping it inside the bowl except its belief that it is the world, okay? But as the days passed, the outsider's words lingered in the fish's mind, sparking a curiosity that couldn't be ignored. What if there was more to the world beyond the bowl? What if 
there were wonders and experiences waiting to be discovered. Driven by a newfound sense of adventure, the fish made a bold decision. With a flick of her tail, she propelled herself out of the bowl and into the vast expanse of the ocean. At first, the fish felt overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the ocean, but the endless stretch of water extending in every direction. But as she swam further and further from her familiar surroundings, she began to see the world in a whole new light. Gone were the artificial decorations of the fishbowl, replaced by vibrant coral reefs teeming with life and colorful fish darting through the crystal clear waters. Each day brought new discoveries and adventures, from exploring hidden caves to dancing with schools of fish beneath the shimmering surface. And with each passing moment, the fish realized that the outsider had been right all along. The world outside the fishbowl was far more magnificent and real than anything that she had ever known. And as she swam alongside her newfound friends, she understood that true fulfillment came not from clinging to the familiar, but from embracing the boundless beauty of the unknown. So, we have heard often, and many of us struggle with the concept that the world is not real. The world of perception, the world, the physical world is not the real world. I'm sure at one time or another, we've all like, yeah. wrestled with that. I, this is this analogy of the fishbowl sitting at the bottom of the ocean with this little fish decorations, but the same water that's in the ocean is a really good way to help me understand that. It, it's not that it's not there, but it's just this little tiny thing. And, and everything inside the fishbowl that I think I know are just plastic ornaments. They're, they're not the, the, the real coral or the schools of fish, the, the mighty companions that are swimming all around me until I finally have enough courage to say, I'm leaving this. But that begins by realizing as the fish in our story realized that this can't be the only thing there is. Beyond this world, there is a world that I want. Beyond this fishbowl, there is an ocean I want. And that's why we call it the infinite ocean of grace. If you imagine this infinite ocean of infinite possibilities, infinite love, infinite holiness and grace, that's where we find ourselves. But we do have to leave that fishbowl behind. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> well, Vicky's not here, so <laughs> she, I don't believe she is. She's off traveling somewhere. But I think Calico is probably here. And so, Calico, I'm going to ask you if you would like to speak for a moment. And then we'll reach out and see if there's anybody else. We don't often do that. But Calico, are you with us? Let me see if I can find her. I don't think I'm Calico here. Oh, there you are. Hello, dear. Hi. So um, what do you think of that parable? Did, did that help at all? Yeah, you know, all those parables. I mean, I think the the parable that first got my attention was um, the cave, you know, of all of us are in the same cave looking at shadows. And it just takes one of us to turn around and see that there's a whole world behind us that we're not paying attention to. You know, and I, I'm so, you know, I'm just getting more and more subtleties of this um, so-called waking up process. And it's just challenging myself at every subtle nuance. You know, and I think of one of the big things that assisted me um, early on, because you know, I almost say, the more educated you are, the harder time you're going to have letting go that you know everything. It's just you've paid a lot of money, you've committed a lot of time, and you know what you know, and you have to let all that go. None of it, none of it means anything. And um, so, a part of my process was to. Um, Oh God, and this happened 
doesn't happen nearly as much as it used to, but it still does happen. A thought, there'd be a conversation going on. And, you know, my mind would immediately go, oh, I know the, I know the answer. I know the answer. You know, that's what was going on inside my head. And there was a very conscious thought that would follow that and keep your mouth shut and put your hand down. You don't <laughs> know anything. And, and it was so, and it was so hard. What my mind went through in that process was, but I do know this, but I do know this. And it was me consciously telling myself to shut it, you know, to zip it, to just, you know, pull back, be humble. And, you know, even though I didn't believe that I, I didn't know anything, I would play that part of humility going, well, okay, maybe I don't know everything. And the way to get to access that mind is to shut up the mind that says it knows something. Mm. And so it, it was, I mean, it was a game I played all the time. And initially there were conversations I'd have to leave, physically leave, because my mind is going, I want to say something. I want to say something. And I'm going, Calico, withdraw yourself and go into quiet and prayer because that's the only place that you can find true peace. And I it always did. Whenever I would take myself out of the game and go into prayer with Holy Spirit of go, okay, show me this differently. Help me see this differently because I think I know something. And it would be, uh, this is even worse than it would get. And it would be helpful to the other. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, ah! I mean, I was, it was in a stranglehold a lot, but the more and more I, I followed this process of just keeping my mouth shut, if it got too much, just leave the, the vicinity, take time, go pray, ask for guidance to see it differently. It got easier and easier and easier. And, and quite frankly, you know, again, I was trained as a doctor. I was a scientist. So I have more beliefs that need to be dismantled on a regular basis, thinking I know something. And my lessons have been tough. It was like being told by the doctors, well, come back in in a couple months, we'll tell you where the cancer is in your lungs. And then I'm hearing from Holy Spirit, start smoking cigarettes. And I'm going, <laughs> wait a second, this, is, this makes no sense. In fact, this seems contradictory. And it was, and I didn't immediately start it, but I did eventually. And I, that went on for a couple of years until one day I, I woke up and thought, okay, I'm done with that. You know, whatever that learning and that lesson was, I'm done with it. And it was effortless to put the cigarettes down. In fact, I still have a pack of them and an ashtray here in the room. But it's kind of like, that's the way my lessons have happened. It's like I have to purposefully prime my pump according to the principles that I'm reading. I say it was Jesus um, that wrote down of how to do this mind training. And um, I have fought it every step of the way. I'll also say that I have not just slid into this effortlessly. This has been a, 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 a path of contradictions because it goes against everything that I did believe was true. And so I had to purposefully face what I thought was true and just say, no, I, I'm not going that direction. I'm gonna trust these principles that make no sense to me on some level, but I know my world was complete chaos. So how could it be any worse than what I was living in to do something completely differently. And quite frankly, you know, I think being in hospice gave me a lot of freedom because I have dear friends that I know they thought I was out of my mind, completely, totally out of my mind on every step of this Course in Miracles path. But no one said anything because they thought, oh, she's dying anyway, give her a break, let her do whatever crazy thing she wants. And I did, I went for it, you know, and, you know, I'm telling people, yeah, I started smoking cigarettes because I, they're telling me it's in my lungs now. And I'm, I'm trying to deal with this in this doctor mind that knew cigarettes were just deadly. 
And it was like, and here I am starting to smoke cigarettes after I was given this diagnosis of cancer in the lungs. Again, it made no sense to me, but the more it didn't make sense to me, I think the bigger the growth that came out of it. Because I really, I, I know what guidance is and guidance is, isn't always, we love you, dear child. We love you. You're so sweet. We love you. We love you. No, it goes in conflict with what I know to be true. And that's where it, it got, you know, I call it, I used to love riding horses and I started a lot of green horses. It was like riding a bucking bronc. It's like you just sit deep in that saddle, you hang on, and you do not let go. You trust this guidance no matter what it's saying to you because everything is a lesson I would learn. So anything that showed up, no matter how horrible it may appear to me or how much I knew I had to do something to change this, I had to just say, no, relax, God's got you. And you're learning how you don't know anything. And that's a big lesson. And I see a lot of these young people I watch on YouTube. I love these young people that are in their early 20s that are really living these lives of they don't know anything, but they're following guidance. You know, there's one guy sleeping in his car and he said his friends have a very hard time with the fact that he's sleeping in his car, but he, his guidance is telling him to do that. And so he says, how can I go against what I know is this divine guidance to follow something that is someone else's opinion of what he should be doing? And I just, I love them. I love listening. There's no young or old people, but it's a whole generational difference in how to live this experience that Jesus is talking about in A Course in Miracles. So I must say, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I completely bit the bite bait and went deep and I don't mind it. I mean, and thank God I'm older. I don't know. Could I do it when I was younger? Maybe, maybe I'd have support for that now, but now it's just like, okay, call me crazy. I don't mind. I don't mind anymore because I'm happy that I know I'm happy 99% of the time, like I said, every now and then something will happen and I'll have this wild hair in my mind going, oh, I know the answer to this one. <laughs> and it's like, mm, zip it, shut up, go to your Ooh. room and pray. <laughs> so, <laughs> James, it's a fishbowl. It's learning how to get out of the fishbowl. That's all. <laughs> That's right. Get out of that fishbowl. Stop, drop and pray, as Vicky would say. Oh, I love that. That is such an unusual lesson, the way that you shared it. Oh, I just got diagnosed with lung cancer. The guidance is start smoking. I mean, it is the exact reverse. And the whole point is, yes, it's the exact opposite to what you've always believed because you're so damn smart. You think you know so much. You're a doctor, blah, blah, blah. You know, But throw it all out the window and trust what I'm telling you. It has nothing to do with what you think it does. You're in a little, just leave the fishbowl, swim away, little fish, swim into this vast ocean. You're going to have an amazing time. And that, I think that's what's happening here. That's what this, that's what the namaste experience is. We started talking about the namaste experience. The namaste experience ultimately is swim away, little fish. You know, and as Calico said, it gets easier and easier and easier. And as it gets easier, easier and easier, you also get happier and happier and happier. And that's how you know it works. So to this we say, Amen. 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 What a great lesson. Thank you, Calico. Thank you, everyone. Vicky should be back tomorrow, and we'll see you then. Yeah. Namaste. Bye-bye. Love you all. Bye, everybody.